Guys, thank you so much for joining on the call today. Uh, I, I know we've had a few technical issues trying to get us all uh, on on the Riverside, um, but uh, we're all here now. I wanted to start off this conversation by going to each of you and asking you what coloring medicine means to you and perhaps how that's evolved actually since you first got involved. So uh, Sumi, why, why, don't, why don't we start off with you? What, what, what did coloring medicine mean to you when you first heard about it? Well, this takes us back to over five years ago now. And for me personally, it came from just a real curiosity to learn more about nutrition. Um, I was a doctor who didn't have very much nutrition training in my own medical education. And I wanted to feel more confident to be able to talk to my patients about nutrition. So when you first started talking about coloring medicine and you put a call out looking for medics or health professionals who are interested, I thought, well, that sounded right up my street. It was um, a learning need for myself. And given my own passion for prevention and my background in education, I was very excited to get involved with actually helping to deliver the course itself. Um, and just very, very happy and proud of the achievements we've made that now our course is running in UCL, my own medical school, in other medical schools, and we are slowly really help to change the face of medical education and how nutrition is delivered to help our patients. So that's how it began for us over five years ago. And um, we pivoted in different directions, but that's really stayed um, true to our initial mission. Yeah. Yeah. Elaine, how about yourself? Because uh, cause you were uh, really sort of um, the, the pivotal piece in, in everything right at the start of the, uh, the inception of the organization. Who's that to me? Yeah, you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, thanks, Ruthie. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, I could really see the gaps in nutrition training from both my NHS role and uh, a role that I have teaching nutrition and medical education. So as a dietitian working in diabetes, I'd frequently see people that hadn't had any nutrition education at all moving on to insulin therapy. Um, and I think that, that we're a bit better now, but since working in medical education, I, I still have medical students asking me, do we really still have to talk about nutrition? Because my GPs told me that we only just, we just give people the pharmacology treatment now. Mm. So there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, uh, and the, the reason I, I got involved with culinary medicine specifically, so I was teaching nutrition in Brighton and Sussex Medical School, but I really worried that lectures felt a bit detached from the clinical application of nutrition. And we discussed nutrients, but that seemed really detached from what people actually really eat. So by cooking, I think that, that it, it helps people to really relate to some of the challenges and opportunities and, and just have a better understanding of how nutrition can be translated. And it, it just inspires some deeper thinking on the subject. So to talk about some of the nuances, to talk about some of the, 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 the difficulties that people have, just to take a, a wider sort of psychosocial, socioeconomic viewpoint on nutrition and, and thinking about what our role is a bit more deeply. And also, uh, it's a lot more fun than PowerPoint. <laughs> um, and I, I think the social learning theory, learning through discussing with each other and discussing some of the challenges and the reasons that, that people may be skeptical skeptical uh, about nutrition I think that's really really important yeah and it, yeah. yeah I've enjoyed it and just to echo what Simi said really is that it's over the last five years uh, we've made great strides in that area uh, but still lots lots to be done yeah chef what about yourself yeah so when I remember it was five years ago now when you came into the college just inquiring about uh, running this at Westminster Kingsway, where, where I'm based at the time. And uh, at the time, I was trying to get this onto chef's curriculum because chefs don't learn about nutrition either. So when you came in, the time couldn't have been better because I was like, brilliant, this is fantastic. We'll be able to finally uh, maybe work together and get something that's tangible for chefs as well, which is something that we are you know, working on in the background. But yeah, it was uh, really exciting. And just to get that opportunity to 
because I bring something different, I suppose, to the team, mm. I guess, in that sense. And just looking at the practical elements of cooking the simple dishes and like yourself, you get some, you, you make, you've got some fantastic recipes. You're doing great stuff as well, Rupi, obviously. But, and then just taking stuff and making it, trying to stick within the five pillars is what we've developed really. It's just some very simple, uh, tangible resources that people can use and really talk to their patients about. And it's been a lot of fun and a really interesting, it's been really interesting actually, because I've learned so much about the medical world as well. And, um, you know, meeting all these doctors and, and dietitians and, uh, really opened up a, a amazing network for myself as well, actually. So yeah. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I first came across coloring medicine myself, and I just thought the collection of having all these different practitioners in a room, all these different disciplines that are all involved in nutrition. And I think a lot of the times we do forget about the culinary element uh, or the practical element um, and what they were doing over in the States and, and some other countries now was just so powerful. And when I went to see it myself, I just thought to myself, we have to try and do this in the uk and put it into medical schools and meeting all you guys you know for over the last five years and working with you to evolve the course evolve exactly what coloring medicine means i think it's just been like one of the best privileges um when you started with coloring medicine i guess everyone's had the inkling of what it meant to them how do you think that's evolved since we actually sat around that room i think it was in westminster king's wave which if the listeners don't know is one of the finest catering colleges uh, in the uk and globally recognized um perhaps uh, elaine and we'll start off with you what, what when you first came across it and we all sat around that table how do you think it's evolved since um those early discussions yeah uh, so I think that, that we started off just by, by thinking about medical students and actually mm. it was doctors was the first um, group that we worked with. And it, it's just become apparent that really it, 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 it doesn't belong to any one profession. So I think there was some interesting discussions at the beginning of shouldn't a dietitian be doing this or shouldn't a nutrition professional be doing this and why a doctor? And I think the conversation has really moved on from that. And I think actually people do accept that we all have a role, but also we, we uh, would like to involve more nurses, pharmacists, or we have involved more pharmacists, uh, um, psychology professionals. So finding a sort of common ground baseline where everybody can input uh, because it's, the magnitude of nutritional problems within healthcare is so great that it really needs to be a thread that, that's consistent uh, amongst all, all clinical practice. So I think that's something that's changed. Um, I didn't realize the role that chefs had, uh, you know, the, the huge potential that chefs have. I, I feel really ignorant now, but I think that, that really in terms of um, how, how food changes and evolves and, and the culture around food, I think that chefs have such a massive role to play. And it's kind of cool to work with health professionals and culinary professionals and work with industry and just to, to, to widen the uh, picture of, of what's possible. Uh, so I think that, that we, we started off just thinking about doctors, but that's widened to lots of different groups, lots of different professionals. Even we've had patients come and be involved with our, our project. So, uh, yeah, the sky's the limit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. V Vinny, that, that's a, a really good sort of segue to you, I, I guess. You know, when I think about a chef, uh, maybe not now, maybe before, I think about how somebody runs uh, a catering organization, a restaurant, how someone injects flavor, how gives, uh, how somebody gives their, uh, their, their patron a, a pleasant experience uh, at any cost, right? I don't really think many people would assume chefs have that interest in health promotion or giving health. That's obviously changed a lot of the last couple of years. Yeah. What, what has the response been from perhaps your community or your um, uh, your own profession. Yeah, so well, I always say that you know making food taste fantastic is quite easy when you're using high fat, fat salt, sugar, cream, and all those lovely, beautiful things that we <laughs> make everything taste so nice. But, um, but actually, making good food healthy and to taste nice is is quite a skill actually, and does take a bit more um, learning. And I can see a lot of the young chefs coming through the college actually are are now approaching 
approaching me and asking what is culinary medicine and what can we do with this and um very interested a big big interest in, in taking that forward which is yeah, something we're working on but um yeah i just i think that again there's no nutritional training on the curriculum um something that i'm still working hard to 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 um, address addressing it in small steps um and i believe that that is something that they really do there is an appetite i mean at the end of the day it's going to get it's going to be driven by consumers um you know so i mean it's like i have many discussions like this for example if you're doing um a menu for 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 a big function and everyone's saying oh what's the vegan what's the vegan and we will prepare a load of vegan stuff but actually how many will actually sell is actually a bit of a strange reflection when you hear how many vegans there actually is and percentages and things like that so it can be quite interesting to what people are you know talking about whether they're actually going to put it into action so i think from consumer demand will really drive the the education plan for all of that moving forward but it's definitely um something a lot of interest in chefs now upskilling and learning a bit more about nutrition and also other things you know i mean uh, there's a you know, sustainability food waste all of that sort of stuff is, is just very um, i think there's a big um, appetite to bring all that together really into a program do you reckon there's it's not like, just, like some... it's consumer policy yeah. we're saying it's sorry. also sorry we're also saying about the importance of policy because it's it, there is consumer driven but there's also the policy from the top yes. and what's actually been driven from the top about what is going to be on people's plates and that also has such an impact so I think we obviously we do recognize at culinary medicine there are so many different players in this and mm. we are an important piece of that puzzle but this whole world of culinary medicine has opened up the importance of collaborating with the policy makers with industry with hospitality with health professionals because it's not just yeah. one organization or sector and that's been a massive eye opener for for me personally. I think yeah, yeah. for all of us, learning about your work, you know, dietetics, hospitality. It's a point I always make is like because sustainability is very big on the agenda. Obviously, um, I found from we do a lot of work with sustainability. We do little bits and pieces, touch on it in curriculum. Um, but obviously, it's getting a bit more prominent now. But you know, if we all eat to a to a healthy plate, for example, it is going to have a has a knock on effect, a, a positive knock on effect to sustainability as well. So. There's a lot of um, things yeah. coming together, you know. I mean, like just N Natasha's law, having uh, having to have more information about allergens, food allergens on menus, the, the calories that was a bit controversial that went onto menus. And yet, as you say, Vinny, I think that with um, the sustainability agenda, I think that that will come down eventually to talk more to legislate more on, on what goes onto menus and, and how we label things. So uh, I suppose we're ahead of the curve there and thinking thinking that through. And also, um, it's not just about healthy eating. So if you've got diabetes or irritable bowel syndrome or you have celiac disease, it's really important that you know what's in the food that you eat. Um, also, with, with the role that chefs can have in product development, it's not just about what's in restaurants, but how do we reformulate foods that are in the supermarket as well? So I, I guess that that's a little bit further than, than uh, we we had originally planned to uh, think about yeah, culinary medicine. And we started with health professionals, but I think it's all relevant. And, yeah, absolutely. and speaking to it on the sort of consumer angle, so really as part of really just making sure that health professionals know about our mission, we certainly didn't see five years ago um, our team hosting events, such big educational events for health professionals. But that's a really wonderful avenue that we now have, especially now the pandemic is, you know, finishing off. People are really keen to meet, mingle, and there's no sort of greater way to connect than over delicious, healthy, nutritious food. Um, and we're seeing ourselves being really leading the way with changing the type of menu that you will see at med like events. So I think traditionally, any particularly medics listening, if you go to sort of educational meetings, usually you might find like, you know, your usual sandwich, lunch, crisps, and, you know, just the usual processed foods and tea and you biscuits. just tea and biscuits. Um, <laughs> and um, so it's been really exciting that, you know, we're now hosting events with other organizations specifically making sure that our menu really reflects our values and creating a healthy nutrition and, you know, really delicious plates with the added 
value of having curry medicine and our experts discussing the ingredients like why is this a gut healthy menu why you know what yeah. what would you learn at the same time so yeah. food is a brilliant been, talking point and we've yeah. been doing that actually at the college which has been really helpful for the students so we can brief them explain why we're doing what we're doing i give them all the little bit of spiel about each dish and why why we're going to why we're creating it in that way and it's creating a lot of excitement actually from the chef students yeah. Yeah, yeah it's so, it's really funny because working in medical education um, is very knowledge based. A lot of the competencies are knowledge based, and that's probably moved on a lot more since the uh, Rupi and Simi you were at medical school. Uh, but I think that a lot of the conversation around nutrition it's about filling students' heads with facts about um, nutrition, but actually what we really want to do is change people's diets and change people's access to healthy food and, and give people more opportunities to eat appropriate healthy nutrition. So I think that, that that's where we're, we're headed. Yeah, definitely. This is certainly one of the bugbears that I have with uh, how nutrition is currently taught, if at all, in medical schools. And sorry to focus just on medical schools for a second again, but you know, it is very parrot learning. It's very fact-based. It's not practical. And as soon as you assume the role of a practitioner, particularly a general practitioner in the, in the UK, you know, you're tasked with motivating that person in front of you. You're tasked with behavior change. You're tasked with trying to make nutrition practical. And it's hard. It is really hard mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're not equipped to do so. And that's where I think culinary medicine really does fill a need. Uh, and, and a massive gap in our education. And, and so the practical elements of, of cooking a lot of, I was going to ask you, Simi, you've probably heard a lot of skepticism mm -hmm. from other medics about, okay, well, what, yeah. why is it important for a, a medical student or a, a pharmacist mm -hmm. or, you know, an undergraduate in an allied health professional mm -hmm. uh, role to learn how to chop an onion uh, and, you know, combine yeah. it with flavors or whatever, like, what 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 are sort of the responses that you have uh, to 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 that sort of pessimism around culinary medicine and and perhaps maybe yeah. the the tide has shifted in the last couple of years in particular uh, uh, you know toward a, a more appreciative note or, around the need for this kind of education. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's a it's a really poignant question actually, and I think you're quite right. I think the I think the scepticism has changed somewhat. Uh, I think maybe when we first started, there was a lot of question marks, misunderstanding. Are you saying that the doctors are going to teach their patients how to cook? Are you, you know, that's not practical. What are you trying to do? So I did spend more time, I think, before explaining. No, we're not suggesting that a doctor is going to go around and start cooking with the patient. Absolutely not. But I think just in the first instance, is the doctor even confident or equipped to even bring nutrition into the consultation? Does the doctor even have it on their radar? And the, the resounding answer was, well, even if they were interested, they weren't even sure how to. So I, you know, it's explaining that culinary medicine isn't, you know, just teaching your patients to cook, it's actually elevating the conversation around food into the consultation, having that confidence. Um, if you just come and watch one of the UCL medical student sessions where they're covering food insecurity, um, we're teaching them about validated screening tool questions so you can screen your patient in front of you for do they have enough food on the table? That's a very, very important question. To not know or have the confidence to ask, I think that's an opportunity missed for the patient. Um, the, the, the clinician doesn't actually feel able to deliver that holistic care. So culinary medicine really does speak to very current issues um, in nutrition and also has that practical aspect of cooking and i think i think maybe even once you said this it's what i would say dissection is to anatomy culinary medicine mm. is to nutrition you're getting students and practitioners in the kitchen handling food and i would consider and it has been the feedback it's a value add not only are clinicians learning how to help their patients they're actually learning how to take better care of themselves and um it's an energizing format and way to learn and and who says CPD can't be fun? Why can't you be gaining a skill, enjoying yourself in the kitchen, networking, talking about cases? Uh, I think it's brilliant. And the feedback really does support um, what we're trying to achieve with culinary medicine. So, 
I was just going to add there, um, so, so I was involved with some research looking at opinions of medical students and doctors in the UK. And in our own research, there's a paper that we published called Time for Nutrition, and we found that 90% of people participating in that study uh, believed that nutrition was central and key part of medical practice. But when we asked that same group, OK, how confident do you feel in delivering nutrition education? Only a quarter felt confident and only a quarter talks about nutrition once a month. Mm. So what we say and what, 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 what people think is important, there's a real mismatch in what's actually happening in practice. And, and that I think that it's all very well learning about nutrition but how to apply it and how that's going to be heard and put into practice with our patients is another um, aspect altogether and just leading on from what, what Sumi said um, we, we have had a lot of feedback now from students so we've been collecting data from our, both our medical students who are attending training and uh, from doctors and I have a couple of choice quotes just to explain from a student's point of view what that means so this is good so cooking oh, allowed me to realize <laughs> yeah yeah thanks Rufi. yeah cooking allowed me to read i have got um permission to do this by the way it allowed me to realize the difficulties that a patient may face also what may be easier when a patient has difficulties with certain aspects for example blending or cutting or allows um, students to think about their own diets, but put themselves in the position of the patient. And I think that skill of empathy in how um, nutrition is not not the six, it's not it's not a level playing field. Unfortunately, people have different challenges, and acknowledging that and thinking about how you might. Uh, cope with that in a skillful way by learning some basic motivational interviewing techniques which we do in our courses helps people to feel more confident to discuss nutrition in a appropriate and realistic way and just to add on to what elaine said about what the medical student feedback has been so as as you're well aware so the the course for the medical students was running we were, you know, I was doing really well. And then the pandemic came along and that's when we segued into um, creating this online course for qualified health professionals to fill that gap in training. We had lots of people saying, oh, you know, I'd love to do culinary medicine. Is there an online course available? So uh, and that set off a whole, you know, different project for us, which uh, I have to say, I'm super proud that we carried that off during a pandemic while we were all in full-time jobs and, we kept it going because we knew how important it was to have that resource out there. And the feedback from our online course subscribers has been in line with what the medical students say. And I'm sure, you know, Elaine's got other quotes from there saying, actually, <laughs> before and after completing our modules, they are feeling more confident with discussing the topics. And we've got 14 modules on there. So Spoiler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's been, that's been, you know, it's really affirms that we're, we're doing something important and, isn't really being delivered in other effective ways. Do you know what was really inspiring to me just a few weeks ago was like one of the GP trainers that comes from UCL was saying how, gave me three different examples of how she had actually applied what she had been teaching alongside the dietitian and how useful mm. she found all the resources. And she was doing this, um, I think she was working even in the UK and somewhere else that she was working outside of the UK as well. So that was really, really um, interesting to see it. Yeah. yeah. What, did, did, did they have any specific? Sorry. So, did, did they have any specific takeaways themselves? Obviously, we won't disclose who it was or, or anything. But like, w w were there things that they uh, practical examples of things that they were actually going to put into practice? Yeah, to having the having the conversation within the time frame was definitely one of them, um, and being able to give actual resources and, and explain to them how they could actually. Um, cook simple dishes and simple stuff. And she actually had used some of the recipes as well that we had given out. So that was quite cool. Yeah. We do now specifically ask all participants how they plan to use the training that they've had in culinary medicine with patients. So, so we've got um, a bank of examples of how people are taking this back to their clinical practice. So, um, so, so, so one simple one is just words and nuance 
to use nutrition in conversation without sounding activist. So I think sometimes like we, could, we really want to do the best we can for our patients, but it can end up a bit lecturing. Mm. So the skills not to, to do that. Um, also uh, advising patients from a de- disease specific viewpoint, especially cardiovascular disease and cancer um, and how to open conversations about sensitive subjects like weight, especially with people that have mental health conditions. So. Uh, these are all things that people have fed back to us that they have changed their practice um, from attending one of our courses or online modules. Yeah, I, I think honestly, in the spirit of uh, openness, if I think back to my initial consultations as a young general practitioner almost 10 years ago now, uh, I probably would have had a lot of judgmental language and lecturary language unbeknownst to me inserted into that Mm. clinical consultation um you know completely unknowingly just because i hadn't had that sort of training or the you know i was regurgitating stuff that i was teaching myself through my own sort of deep dives into nutrition uh but the delivery of that you know isn't as um exchangeable as it is you know when you're giving uh, other sorts of advice around other sort of lifestyle changes or medication regimes or whatever it might be um, so just having those takeaways, I think, for GPs is uh, uh, particularly useful, any uh, allied health professional. And I think the other thing is just from doing the course and being, um, you know, w- one of the coordinators on the early courses, I was exposed to how uh, prevalent those sort of nutrition uh, misnomers or, or the, the sort of misinformation that the general public is exposed to is also quite prevalent amongst practicing medics Um, and you know trying to disentangle where they got the information from what led to that Mm. sort of belief i i i was pretty eye-opening for me um because everyone i think believe has strong beliefs about um nutrition themselves that are the product of a lot of the experiences a lot of the headlines that their own personal journeys you know that led mm-hmm. to uh, to to sort of give advice from that sort of authoritative position i, I wonder elaine if that's something that you might have come across yourself in uh, in, in some of the uh, yeah yeah <laughs> 100% and and you know the, the interesting thing about some of the uh, Educate. We do. We we teach nutrition in in two different medical schools. For UCL Medical School, it's, it's actually delivered to the whole cohort. So everybody who goes to UCL Medical School has one day session with us in the kitchen, learning about culinary medicine. So we're not preaching to the converted. These are not people that have said, "Okay, I want to do culinary medicine today." These are people who come with, you know, quite a lot of skepticism and many biases as well. So it's really important to to have that honest discussion around people's different biases and viewpoints on nutrition, because uh, we we have to reduce our bias when when we're thinking about patients. Our most popular module now, which I'm really proud of because it's it's something that's really close to my heart, is our module on food insecurity. And obviously, it's it's so relevant, isn't it, at this time when we're facing a cost of living crisis. But, uh, you know, it's not as simple as just getting a textbook and saying, here's what I've learned about nutrition or this is what I've applied to myself. And so I'll just share my diet and then somebody can follow that. Like it really takes a lot of skill and unpicking um, in order to really relate to patients or, or, or to find something that's very tangible that people can address. Mm, yeah. And, and just think- to add to what Elaine was saying, we have, we especially myself, working in general practice, the way things are at the moment, we don't want to overburden health practitioners. We don't want to add another thing to their list. I know GPs, they'll have quaff, they'll have medication reviews, they'll have a patient coming in with three things. And that was something that I was really keen to avoid with our course, making it complicated. We actually want to demystify the various, you know, the sea of misinformation out there. So to that end, the culinary medicine course and the course writers are experts. They've done the hard work. They've presented the, the presentations and lessons in a, 
easy to understand format and the value add, particularly with the online course, is that the resources have been vetted. We've looked at the best resources that you can then share with your patient so that it doesn't have to be a, a difficulty. It's something that you're like, right, I know, I know what to help my patient with. I know where to signpost them. The very fact that clinicians are now actually bringing food or you know, just even trying to help somebody who's facing food insecurity, as far as we're concerned, that's a massive gain mm. and we're doing the right thing. Um, even if, say, another 100 practitioners are speaking about food insecurity with their patients who need it, that's helping a whole community. So I think making it easy for practitioners to access that information and have those resources has been really key and um, an area that we're keen to keep developing our bank of resources. So to make it easy for practitioners to do that. Yeah. And just playing devil's advocate here, Simi, you know, for mm. the number of um, medics who are interested in the subject, there's going to be the majority, I would say, who are perhaps less interested in it, in it today, yeah. just as a product of not being taught about the importance of mm. it at medical school. And then that leads to a lot of dissatisfaction amongst a lot of patient groups, right? So you've got some patients who are like, well, my, my doctor didn't tell me anything about this. No nurse, no doctor, no one has yeah. talked to me about diet and they're just trying to push pills on me. And the reverse probably as well of a patient mm -hmm. who wants a pharmaceutical or a sort of quote unquote harder intervention than the softer lifestyle stuff that they're being promoted uh, by their practitioner how, how do you reconcile with those seemingly opposite uh, camps? And I'm, I'm sure you've probably come across this in, in your own practice as a, as a partner. Yeah, so I think it's about raising, raising awareness. So, you know, I'm a very tr traditional medic in the way that I've been trained. I've done, you know, my diplomas are in all the very traditional topics. Nutrition came out, like you said, a genuine curiosity and interest. Mm. I've always been passionate about prevention. A lot of the work we do in NHS, it's a lot of firefighting simply because we are time strapped. Having said that, um, as Elaine said, we are having medical students on our course who didn't sign up for culinary medicine. They are, it's a compulsory part of their training. And even then the feedback still supports that it's mm. positive for them. They're learning, they're coming across things that they hadn't even thought about. Um, so I believe it is about raising awareness. And in terms of really facing the skeptics you can't again again force feed um this to people but i think having the events that we're doing lots of different people come who are not that interested but thought, oh, okay i'm interested I'll, I'll just see what's what, what it's about even if i'm skeptical and then actually when they actually speak to us or they hear from other people who've done it and what it's about even they are interested i was having mm. a conversation at sort of the london wide medical committee which is an annual conference of general practitioners and i met quite a few other GPs who have a portfolio career, um, working frontline GP, but also interested in different areas. And they were quite interested in what, what we're doing, but they hadn't, they hadn't heard about culinary medicine. So it was quite interesting to hear their feedback. It's like, oh, actually, I would, I would have been quite interested. Again, it, it's, a, it's a time factor. So yeah. I, I strongly feel that if the sea of change is towards prevention, training health professionals will be at the, should be at the heart of that. And making this compulsory instead of, you know, forward thinking medical schools incorporating it is something that, you know, the higher, you know, Health Education England, NHS England will advocate for this to be more widely available and perhaps part, permanent part of the medical curriculum, which is what we had been aiming for from the start. So it's taken, a, it's taking time to get there, but there is that shift. And I think more and more practitioners are interested um, seeing how it can affect their, their patients, their population. It's really, really key that we address these factors. Yeah, we, we, do, we do have some evidence that things are changing. So we always ask medical students if they've witnessed any discussions on nutrition from the, the doctors that they spend time with or health professionals they spend time with. And when we started this, it was a definite no, 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 never, never heard anybody talk about food or nutrition, never, ever. And that has really changed. It's really noticeable uh, that, that they could give a lot more examples of where they're seeing this being applied in practice. Um, and also, uh, we, we've had reports from doctors that are working in clinical practice that have had medical students attend our training and then go back out and speak to the doctors that they're working with. Oh, hey, like, you know, you've just done this course that was really interesting. Do you include nutrition in your consultations? And I've got this 
tool that I use, which is a five minute conversation on nutrition. Um, so uh, slowly, slowly, the word is getting out, and and it, 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 we're we're not unique in this. This is this is just following a well-established evidence base of the role of nutrition in life in, in chronic disease management and prevention. Mm. One of the things that I think we mentioned earlier is this um, uh, focus on food insecurity. It's great to know that the that that particular course is so well received. And I think part of the issue um, is y- yeah, the, there is the, the inability of accessing certain foods, but I think it's also that culinary confidence piece. And this is where I think Chef uh, Vinny and, and your, your colleagues are so pivotal because it's around finding the use cases for the perhaps cheaper, more accessible food and actually still creating something that's delicious and good for you as well. I, I wonder if you could give us some of your thoughts on how you know, you've created those budget meals as well as being sensitive to the, the cultural variation in the patients that we have uh, across urban environments, but also across the country. Yeah, so... I mean, first thing is we look at accessible ingredients. So, you know, we start talking about tint. We talk a lot about tint and frozen product and that. And we, we have a lot of discussions on that. And we kind of show the medical students, you know, how, how cheap you could actually can make a meal and how you could use up different parts of everything as well. And just trying to give them a... Because what you want to do is give people the confidence to be able to go to their fridge, look at what's there and produce a meal for their exactly. family. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah and little tips and tricks to try and make that happen. So whether that's just, I don't know, say you have some sweet sweet potato mash left over from something or potato mash in general as well, that like you could um, use that up in uh, make little potato cakes and stuff, make that part of the next day's meal, or you could use up a puree, make a puree of some leftover vegetables there and then just put that into a, a simple white sauce and just make your pasta bake that way. Um, so you're just adding in as much vegetable and fiber into everything that you make, and then the whole brown pasta and brown rice. But you know, culturally, that can be trying to make that cultural switch for people to brown rice from white rice can be it's quite a it's quite a job actually. Um, but <laughs> when you do it, show them how it can taste them. Um, we are we are you know we are trying to make little trying to make little interventions all the time. My day job as a I work with a lot of different. Uh, communities a lot of different cultures and uh, often have little discussions with them about that sort of thing and um, how open would you be to be put more vegetables into them rice dishes and things like that you know so yeah and it's uh, we so we've had a lot of discussions with different cultural kind of me and Elaine were talking about this not so long ago actually and cultural connections through food um, and just seeing what we could do there because we've had a few discussions with different food banks and things about how we could actually make better recipes and easier recipes around different cultures and um, made not by me but alongside some people from them backgrounds mm. to be able to I, i'm learning a lot doing that and um, so we're, we're looking it's at not that. just the food and the nutrition it's about um human connection and you, it's very difficult to be getting your food from a food bank but uh so, so we've been considering how we can work with community kitchens and, and getting people just into a social space where cooking is a central point for a discussion. Um, th- there's been some research into this, looking at people with long-term health conditions that are accessing food banks for support. And the, the, this research, it's a, a professor, Flora Douglas, uh, and they asked these, these patients, what is the most important thing that your health professional can do for you at the moment in your, in your current situation where you're, you're struggling to afford food. And the most important thing they, they mentioned was that they listen. Mm. And you know that, that kind of blew me away actually, is actually what, what they wanted is for, for health professionals to, to know what they're facing, to not feel judged and not to have to hide the situation that they're in. Um, and also um, because they weren't able to eat they were missing medication. So we prescribe mm-hmm. medication and say, have this with food. Um, and, and so many people just weren't able to take the tablets or didn't know how to do this because they couldn't access the food that they normally ate. Um, yeah, so there was, a, there was a, you know, so, so health professionals, can, you can fear mentioning poverty 
and think that you have nothing to offer. But even just that, that kind ear, just, just being better informed, um, being able to signpost to practical support was what, what people really wanted. Yeah, it's it's really interesting that I think as I've developed clinical maturity and I've got a long way to go, I think, over the next couple of decades of, of practice, but I've become a little bit more uh, confident in just the simple act of listening as a therapeutic yeah. tool. And, and you know, I, I mean, a silly example, uh, even at home, sometimes when I offload to my partner, I don't want a solution. I just want her to listen. I, just, I don't need any answers. Mm -hmm. I don't need any sort of like, you know, five point plans. I just need to be listened to. Um, and it, it's it's a very similar scenario. Not all the time with, with every single patient. Sometimes, you know, we, we definitely need to find a solution. But in, in a lot of cases, it can be that uh, actually just a simple act of listening. It's so, so important, particularly yeah. when it comes to you know people who are really Absolutely. motivated and have really tried to, to do a lot of things. They need to be heard. They need to be seen that they've they've put all those uh, different things in, in, in practice. Sorry, Vinny, you were saying something. Sorry, uh, just a bit listening and a lot of pressure on medical professionals to listen to people as well, though I will say, and they do need to listen to each other too a little bit. I think that needs to be said too. And I do notice when we, when we, when we're doing the cooking in the sessions, all the medical students are together and it's very therapeutic, I suppose, making cooking food, making salads, doing stuff like that and just working with your hands and they do chill out and they do relax and they do actually network quite well and talk to each other and, and, and listen to each other as well. You know, there's so much, um, so much that can be learned through food in that way, you know. Um, and, and and if you talk about examples, I mean, you know, we're talking about cultures and trying to get them to change. Kids, I've got three kids, and um, and like when you're preparing food for them, they're like, I'm trying to get them to eat brown rice and brown pasta. I mean, it's great at the beginning because you can, you know, you start off when they're young and you give them all the brown rice, brown pasta. Then they go to a friend's house, they come home and they're like, Hey daddy, I had this wonderful white fluffy rice. It's it's group consultations. It's, I think that's why group consultations work so well, is because people can speak openly, be heard, and hear other people's experiences. So there's a whole body of work looking at this social learning theory um which you don't get as an individual one person in a lecture yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and, and i think really what what we really speak about again just emphasizing about multi-professional learning and again we the nhs is under a lot of pressure consultations are complicated i guess really it's just making sure that food is not forgotten as part of that and if you don't have time knowing where to refer your patients so they can get more support while they're still seeing you about maybe particular other issues it may not seem directly re related but it's going to really support their health and i know in general practice having social prescribers um linked to practices has been quite a game changer for us and mm. um, being able to say right i'm going to direct you to so and so they'll talk to you more and then again educating the social prescribers about what's happening in the community i, I work in greenwich there's um gdca they're they run fantastic cookery clubs for for patients um so people can get together and learn the skill and our social prescribers can then follow on see how the patient's getting on so there's a lot of scope for more joined up care and working together and then as elaine says with group consultations or virtual group consultations, just opening up that conversation and allowing patients to see, you know, common ground and how they can help each other with that as well. So really there's, more community. And there's so, yeah, because there's so many great things going on out there. There really mm -hmm. is a sense that we've seen that obviously a lot more um, come together and, and some have really sustained themselves and they're still running some really interesting projects around and uh, that's been kind of blowing me away through my, again back to my day job or what i'm doing and when i'm doing all my outreach things to the community and the stuff that's going on it's really fantastic yeah. to see and mm -hmm. sure it's just no one ever knows it's happening yeah, it's isn't about, it that community yeah. kind of communication 
I think that's this it. Is... And I think it's really about raising awareness of what is happening. And there's, there is actually a lot happening. It's just getting that information out there. We've taken a small step, as I said, with our cause to put resources, but they're national. Board, and we've got a discussion board. And it's been really brilliant seeing the comments from users of our course saying, oh, in my area, we have this. They're like, oh, that sounds really good. And it just piques people's interest. And I think it helps people to then say, actually, what's happening in my area? I think in an ideal world, we'd have regional yeah. um, organizations, we'd know about them, we'd be able to pull them into some sort of a directory. And I think over time, mm. we will build our resources and organization bank. Um, but it's, it is really inspiring to learn what is happening in the community. And personally, as a practitioner, culinary medicine has opened up a whole new new world for me in that, in that sense. Um, as an yeah. add-on to help with my patients. Yeah, but, but I mean, that's what actually... a really simple... Yeah, sorry, yeah, it's a really simple model that we use in our training is ask, advise, assist. So ask, ask somebody a little bit about how is nutrition um, change, how is nutrition, how's your, your food intake changed since you've had the diagnosis of diabetes or whatever that is. How might you use food um, at home to manage your condition to get a little bit of a feel of what people are doing at the moment. The advice part might be, you know, a discussion about what you might do, but the assist part is really crucial. And that's where you signpost people to what's available already in the local area. So it's not just our role, what we can achieve in education within a small consultation. It's about how we connect the dots to wider support that's available. And I think that's really, really crucial. Yeah, that, that's one of the things I think along my own journey um, since uh, uh, we started Coloring Medicine is actually finding out about other organizations that are working either at a national level or at a local level um, in the food space. And it's almost like there's a silly parallel within technology right now. You can build a product, let's say it's five years old, and it's grown to such a size that there's all these little bits that are sort of like okay but they could be optimized but no one's really focusing on mm. those little things yeah. because there's loads of more important things outside of that sort of core product and you need almost someone to go in and be the chief automator to look at all those little things that could be done better and automate them away and it's sort of like that's the role of a social prescriber in the context of a of a general practice setting someone to go in and be like you know what there is a local cookery school here 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 they're accepting people this would be a great sort of initiative or there are food banks here or there's this initiative here mm -hmm. you know the government has just started and as a single practitioner whether you're you know the nurse in that or the administrator or the 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 uh, medical practitioner you're not going to be have to, you, you're not going to have the time to know about all these amazing initiatives because you're you know doing your cough points or you're finding out about the latest therapy for toe and, and and nail fungal infections you know it's just all these different things that people don't really appreciate and i think having someone whose <laughs> sole role is to look at what existing solutions there are and join the dots, I think is really yeah. important. And so to just to echo on your point, Elaine, Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a really important feature of what we do at Culinary Med is not to um, educate everyone from zero to 100, is actually to get mm -hmm. them to a point and actually point to where they should be, you know, sending their patients or, or mm -hmm. other organizations that are doing great stuff. Absolutely. Can I just add one little point, just um, with, Social prescribers have such a huge role. It's a really skilled job, um, but there's not currently any structure for formal education or formal promotion. Or So I, I think we, we all talk about how much we love social prescribers, and I, I hope that social prescribers listen to this because they do such a fantastic job. But I think we really need to honour that and, and help them to, to progress their careers in a way that would be similar to other NHS staff. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and when you think about culinary medicine, of like, Sumi, you were talking about the journey that we've been on thus far. You know, it yeah. started off in, I, I can't remember where it was, like a little coffee store. And then like, I used to invite people <laughs> around to my house and basically bribe you with food and cook for you because yeah. we didn't have any fun. <laughs> we didn't have anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was just like loads of everyone just working out of hours, which 
<laughs> Ruby, Ruby, we haven't cooked for us in a long time. I think it's time we started. Uh, again. It's been a while. Well, you've got <laughs> Chef Vinny now, so he's taken over that role. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and, it, and it's still like a, a ragtail sort of rickety organization that we just kind of, kind of piece together and keep going because, you know, everyone's got this shared vision and passion. But like, what are the, the key mm. milestones to me that you could sort of summarize for the listener who's not come across Coloring Med before, what we've done in the UK at least? And, uh, and maybe mm. we can go on to like, you know, what we're doing imminently and then perhaps what the future of CM yeah. looks like. Yeah, so so our very first um, in-person culinary medicine training was in February 2018. We'd got together a few months before this this small team of passionate individuals from different areas, from dietetics, medicine, psychology, research, who re on board with this concept of culinary medicine. Somehow, you know, we got this amazing college involved, Westminster Kingsway, you know, UK's number one hospitality school. So I think that was a real, really, really lucky piece of this puzzle. And I think if we didn't have an institution like Westminster Kingsway, I'm not, I just don't think we would, we could have carried on as we did. So we were very fortunate to have those contacts and supporters behind us here. Mm -hmm. And um, that pilot went incredibly well. And from there on, we've been able to develop the curriculum um, embedded within medical schools. As Elaine says, we've got Bristol and UCL who are still running to this day. And then in between, um, let's not forget for two to three years, we've been in a global health pandemic. And um, it's credit to the team that that didn't that didn't stop us actually, which I find remarkable. Um, and we're very fortunate that we get you know support and, and, and grants to create this online course as well. So it's over 21 hours of CPD learning, again, to fill that gap in training for qualified health professionals. And at this stage, we were really championing multi-professional learning, inclusive learning. So um, ideally suited to you know, busy clinician, a GP, also suited to other health practitioners and social prescribers may wish to read about it and learn on our course. And being able to create culinary medicine in an online format was quite crucial, I think, to, to sort of stay relevant because it wasn't possible to run courses in the kitchen. And um, and credit to the team for being able to pivot because during the pandemic, almost overnight, we went from having medical students coming into the kitchen mm. to suddenly going online. And actually, probably, Vin, Vin, probably the best person to explain because it was really just kind of putting things together. And yeah. I remember you saying about um, what you did. Yeah, we had to. Uh, I mean, I didn't have a chance to go get any fancy cameras or anything either. So we were, there was all sorts of balancing going on, on my iPad, uh, and we we're trying to just do and cook along from the kitchen and stuff. Um, and then we had, luckily, had made start making some videos as well, so we were able to share some of the videos and then just discuss, you know, any barriers you may come across with the patients and things like that from a practical food point of view. That was kind of the best that we could do. But what did happen was a lot of people actually. Um, would we we then send them the recipes and they were making the stuff at home and they were taking pictures and putting up on social media and tagging us and stuff so it was quite cool. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was so funny that the last the last social event I went to before lockdown was the opening of our community our kitchen our mm. teaching kitchen which is in Westminster Kingsway. So yeah. it's like yay we're open no we're closed and then the next. <laughs> Yeah. Me and Vinny were teaching the next week online and he sent me a picture yeah. of his setup with his camera, which was his iPad just sellotaped to the side <laughs> of a crate. It was really high tech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, like uh, learning, learning on our feet. Yeah. Yeah. We did it and we had good feedback, didn't we? From even from our online sessions. I think everybody in their own room really appreciated um the conversations that we were having and it, it, we had a bit of fun online as well yeah and then from there on as i said i i can't i think i've lost count of how many meetings we all had over zoom <laughs> to get this course together we had count I, i've lost count we had countless meetings on zoom project managing you know communicating with our amazing team of authors we've got the leading experts who've been so you know passionate and helpful to us about their different areas uh, working with tech companies. I mean, that's a new thing for us, working with tech companies to produce a, a, an online course that's you know, user-friendly and we're still developing that. And um, there was some slight delays to launching, naturally, because we were all working in 
front, you know, frontline jobs and really busy with that. So um, we did eventually launch our online course in September of 2022. Yeah. So that was at BSLM. So that was a really proud moment for us. We were sponsoring the uh, British Society of Lifestyle Medicine um, annual conference uh, and we were so delighted with the positive yeah. reception re received and so so many practitioners you know came to speak to us to say that you know they really loved what we were doing and were so excited to engage with the course so that was a, a you know major 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 milestone for us to actually finally launch that course and keep the medical student training going and growing our team so you know, we've, Elaine, Elaine's been a powerhouse. We've got, we've got other dietitians who are now um, running the teaching programs in, in the country, other chefs who are now involved with delivering the teaching. And um, we we're just having a meeting the other week about what's going to happen in the in the next academic year. Nice for me, I'm going to be able to teach my old alma mater at UCL. So I'm excited about that. And, um, you know, we've got, you know, more exciting events and um, CPD opportunities as well. So um, can, we can talk. There's, there's lots. There's lots going on. It's very exciting. So Ale we're still here yeah. growing. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a good point. Elaine, why, why don't you give us some insight into what people could find on the online course? Because you were obviously involved in reviewing yeah. and, and actually gathering together the, this group of experts. And, you know, there's too many online modules to go through every single one, but maybe some of the key ones that anyone listening to this who is a medical practitioner or perhaps even a nurse w would want to engage with? Yeah, sure. So um, it's uh, specific to diff different medical conditions, type 2 diabetes, uh, weight and health, pediatric module. Um, we do one module on health professionals' own personal nutrition, um, uh, but we also uh, focus on food sustainability and thinking about the environmental impact of food, as well as we have a module on food and nutrition insecurity. Uh, one on motivational interviews, we have a whole module dedicated to how, how to have a conversation around food. Mm. And we have a whole module dedicated on uh, how to discuss culinary skills within our, our healthcare setting. And lots of videos. So Vinny's put together some videos, recipe videos. So. They, uh, simple things like how to cook uh, vegetables or use up leftover vegetables, uh, nice skills, things that are very, very practical that can mm. help people with confidence in the kitchen at the same time as, as learning from a mid technical nutritional science. Th this, and the other uh... thing that was a planning ad is that we do also offer hybrid learning. So to if there are online subscribers who wish to come and cook with chef, we do offer that as well. So Vinny's been running these cook and learn sessions as well at Westminster Kingsway for yeah, online we, subscribers. And it's not just me as well. So we have a dietitian then comes in for the last 30 minutes and um, via Teams, but the way the kitchen's set up and all now, we've got a really cool um, center for culinary medicine now here at the college. And uh, you get to use the, well, the kitchen and great equipment there. We do a bit of cooking. We talk a little bit about a few sustainability issues. And then we get the dietitian to come on and just talk about, you know, the course and any questions we might have about the course and stuff like that, which is quite good. So, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of added value. For, for I, I think one of the things yeah. with think... nutrition is that when you dive into this world, you have a lot of quite ingrained beliefs, even amongst the community of, of medics who, you know, on a self-assessment feel very rational and, you know, analytical but actually, when it comes to it, you know, that they, they are quite, um, they've put their stake in the ground with a particular dogma within nutrition. And, I'm, you know, specifically, we can talk about low carbers or paleo first versus plant based, uh, vegan. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a whole milieu as, of reasons as to why people find those camps. How, and this is a difficult topic um, because we're trying to like, you know, see both sides and, and that's what I try and do on, on this podcast as well. But I, I imagine this has been a challenge, uh, particularly when it comes to, you know, presenting the evidence base and actually creating a, an online course that caters for uh, both sides and, and, you know, takes a, a balanced view. What, what's your experience of that been, um, Elaine, uh, in, in this particular? Yeah, way? that's really, yeah. Uh, it, it's something that comes up 
uh, time and time again. So, so there's evidence in both camps. <laughs> you know, like we are, as humans, uh, very adaptable species. So, so we've survived and thrived on many different diets all over the world. If you look at the blue zones, the Okinawa diet is very different to a diet in um, Costa Rica, for example. So, so I think that, that, that we've tried to cut through the noise uh, by presenting in, in your know, short bullet points some of the main points from each dietary uh, intervention, but actually looking at the common ground in the middle. And there, there's, that, there's so much common ground. For it. So if you're looking at plant-based vegan diets compared to low carb diets the common ground there is is that they're still both very rich in vegetables they're still the, the ones that are beneficial anyway um you know it, a real focus on less processed foods and uh, so so we we can and, and i think it's important and i would love to have a uh, culinary medicine session low carb and vegan and just get mm. everybody together knock their heads together and just go right okay well you, you know let's have a discussion about this because there's no it's so nuanced there's there's no right or wrong and we have to respect that our opinion on nutrition may be completely different to patients in front of us so yeah. We're the least important person here, really. It depends mm -hmm. on what people choose to do with their own diets. And then we can support people through their own choices rather than trying to impose our choices, which either you're going to love as a patient and that's fine. You might join that way of thinking or you're going to be completely put off nutrition and never want to engage in that discussion again. If we go to militant on this so uh, we do need to discuss this i don't think that discussions are as bad as they seem on social media so social mm. media algorithms really polarize the argument but this isn't how things are getting played out in real life you know mm. real the real world is different from twitter thankfully <laughs> and, and like, I, I, I couldn't agree more and i think that's I think this is what sets culinary medicine apart from perhaps other education providers. Because, I mean, I was a member of BSLM being asked, oh, is this a course for vegans? And I was like, no, yeah. absolutely <laughs> not. So our course is very much about really looking at the evidence and focusing on actually how would you deliver this to a patient? I always say the example is if I'm seeing my, my patient who's working nights and days he's a firm meat eater and he barely has half an hour in the day to prepare food he's not going he may not he unlikely to be changing his entire diet to become recommend him for example so i think it's really about looking at the individual in front of you respecting their choices their lifestyles their time their budget their culture yeah. there are so many factors so i'll always say no culinary medicine is about really looking at your individual patient and their factors and seeing what's right for them and we're helping a practitioner to actually look at what evidence is there. In fact, you know, we'll have slides saying, this is what we do know, this is what we don't know, and these are the studies. And it really spells out, and that has been super helpful to me because um, some, some things I wasn't entirely sure about, at least by doing the course, it's really helping to demystify areas. And again, it's taking away that polarity um, mm. and sort of forcing your own individual beliefs. And, and that's the ethos of healthcare. It's really about where's, where's the evidence? What can we say with confidence? What, what, what does my patient need? I, that's really at the heart of it. So I'm very much um, keen for that, that ethos to be very clear for culinary medicine that we aren't ascribing to a particular diet. We're just looking at what's the right diet and nutrition advice for your patient who's in front of you. I think that's really key. Yeah. Yeah, I think actually providing a, a a safe space to have those spirited debates is something that maybe coloring medicine yes. can do in future events. Actually, I think that would pull in a lot of people. You know, you have someone who perhaps yeah. is of a low carb persuasion, uh, and someone who is you know more plant based, uh, whole grain focused, and just you know sort of present both sides of it, and actually allowing people to come to their own conclusions about how they might put both of those camps into practice with with people like you know assuming that example i think is is really pertinent and it's some 
uh, that that kind of archetypal uh, archetypal patient is is uh, someone that mm. a lot of medics listening to this podcast have probably come across as well. Yeah, but that's the reality, and I think we we really want to keep it realistic. Um, yeah. And as, as Elaine said, I think social media is a really small area of what you see it can be quite skewed. And if you're on the front line, if you're dealing with patients, the community. You, anyone who's listening will understand where where the angle that we're coming from. It's really got to be accessible and realistic to the patient in front of you in their lives. Yeah, and, and that's why as long as we can keep culinary medicine uh, case based, focused on patients, not ideal ideology. Mm. Um, so yeah, keeping it, it's it's not about what is the absolute perfect diet. Mm. It's about you know how can we apply some of these principles to 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 improve people's lives. Yeah, yeah. If I if I get asked one more time, what oil do I use to fry in? I'm going to... <laughs> 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 what oil do you fry in? We're not deep frying. It's okay. We're just pan frying a little bit of fish. It's going to be okay. Don't worry. Um, yeah, sunflower oil will do. <laughs> We've got. Um, you have to cut uh, that out. Rapeseed. You have to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got um, uh, the summer school coming up. Uh, which is going to be in yes. July. So if people are listening to this after July, unfortunately, it's 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 past. But we've got a summer school. So t- what, what, Simi, why don't you tell us a bit yeah. about that two-day um, yeah. uh, workshop? Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're super excited. So as I said, I couldn't have imagined five years ago that we'd be sitting here talking to you about collaborating with you know international leading experts in their fields and having such a you know like an exciting union like this. So we. Um, held a one-day introduction to nutritional psychiatry in October at Westminster Kingsway. And we were hosting the Food and Mood Centre from Australia, led by Professor Fili- Professor Felice Jacka, who you know well. She's been a guest on your podcast as well. Absolutely brilliant um, researcher, speaker, and um, her team, including um, Tatiana Rocks, who's uh, got a dietetics background as well. And... Um, Chef Vinny and his team were um, providing the culinary medicine uh, demonstrations to tie it all together. So we, we tried it just as a concept because we really wanted to widen the reach. And there's so much interesting research going on in the area of um, nutritional psychiatry. And um, we're putting ourselves at the forefront there by collaborating with the, the best people. Because again, this area, there's a, a lot of misinformation out there. And we want to make sure that health practitioners who come to our course can feel, feel confident that they're learning from the experts. They're, they're the only organization in the world who's doing this kind of research over several mm. years. So we're confident with what they're delivering. And we really just want to partner with organizations who have a similar ethos to ours and want to help with elevating that conversation, helping patients with mental health conditions and also tackling behavior change. So we tried, we, we held that in, in October, went really well. We gathered feedback. There was a you know appetite for a more detailed course. And then the summer school was born. So we've been busy working away at that for the last few months. Uh, really excited to host them for two days. That's on the 7th and 8th of uh, July. And there'll be pre-reading online material that you can access. You'll come along into our uh, our venue. You'll be learning from Professor Felice Jacker and her team about the latest in nutraceuticals, learning about prebiotics, probiotics, all the questions you may have about what, what can we help our patient with their uh, mood disorders? What don't we know? So you will learn a, a lot. It's over sort of 15 hours and of you'll, CPD. And, and you'll get to cook. put it into a bit of practice as well. Yes, so, and you'll get to cook with yeah. Chef Eddie himself um, <laughs> in our Thank newly you, refurbished kitchen. So yeah, we're excited. There'll be case-based discussions. As Elaine said, that's central to what we're doing. So I'll be there helping to facilitate those case-based discussions as well. And um, it's an opportunity to network and we, uh, we love food at Culinary Medicine, so you can be guaranteed to have a delicious food with us as well. So yeah, yeah. we can't wait for that. It really does encompass everything I think that Culinary Medicine is about, you know, these workshops. Yeah. And I think rather than it just being an online course, which are, which is great, you know, even, you know, even mm-hmm. though we've got like wonderful videos and stuff, like when you actually get into a kitchen, you actually start chopping an onion and having a conversation with, some culinary students and, you know, dietetics and all people from different specialties. Like that's where the magic is. That's where like you really get like rich conversations and, 
you connect over something yeah. that's deeply human. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And, you know, I, I, I'm obviously very biased because when we sat down <laughs> years ago and I was sort of painting this vision for what coloring medicine could be, I really wanted it to be the sort of nutritional medicine platform for, for medics and all professionals in the future. I have my own sort of idea about what coloring medicine should evolve into. Um, I've always wanted to capitalize on this idea of community kitchens being affiliated with every GP surgery in the country. You know, I think even if there isn't one bespoke built kitchen in the surgery itself, there should be an affiliation with a local cookery school um, where you have health communicators and you know people who can improve the culinary confidence um, of of their, their local population. But then also having mm. culinary medicine as compulsory in all medical schools. Now we've, we've, we've done one out of 30 or medical <laughs> schools in the UK, um, but we've still got a long way to go. When you think about culinary medicine over the next five years, let's say, you know, what, what are the kind of goals that you want to achieve? And I know we've had loads of conversations about this off the podcast and everyone's trying to say, you know, you Ruby, you need to get real. You need to, this isn't going to happen <laughs> on this kind of time scale. But I, I still believe, I still really want this to happen. But perhaps, uh, Elena, I'll, I'll put it to you first. Like w when you think about culinary medicine in the future, forgetting all the sort of short term barriers that we might have today, like where, where would you want it to get to? Yeah, I just think we just need to keep widening in our network. So work with more medical schools, give more opportunities for people to get into the kitchen. I 100% agree with you, Rupi, that getting people in face-to-face -to, -face to have these discussions is so important. And uh, I think that we've all learned through the pandemic the importance of community and the importance of food within that. So uh, absolutely expanding our work to work with perhaps the public and working within community kitchens, supporting what's already out there um, and joining the dots between health professionals. So just uh, bigger, more and more people involved. Simi? And yeah, I, 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 think, I think I was in sure there was a pause. Sorry. So Holly Medicine in the next five years. So I want us to cement what we're already doing, um, growing the medical student population and their education. Um, it's taken a longer time than any of us had thought five years ago. Mm. However, there is, a, there, is a, there is a change coming. I think you only have to go to sort of conferences, you go to the BSLM, you'll see people are really passionate about prevention and nutrition. And we have done excellent work in culinary medicine. I think that can continue. Um, I am particularly excited for us to continue with our partnerships and collaborations because we recognize there are lots of different strong organizations we can work together with them um just this recent summer school being able to work with the leading researchers really helps to deliver the message that we're we're aiming for so continuing partnerships and collaboration and naturally every time we're doing events we get a lot of inquiries from members of the public saying oh i wanted to join the summer school but i noticed it's only for health professionals Absolutely. so yeah. i believe there's a lot of work and potential for us to develop our public awareness and engagement working with the right outlets to be sending the correct messages to disseminate evidence-based information so it's really making sure that we are joining the dots and putting out the right information to to sync with health professional education and public awareness. I, I think that would be um, ideal for us. And I think given how we've established ourselves, I feel Culinary Medicine UK are ideally suited to be able to deliver on that. So it's a question really of the time, organization, and really getting the support and investment from key organizations. So hopefully in the next 12 months, we, we will be able to make some changes towards that as well. Yeah, no, I would basically echo that really i suppose public awareness and i i guess with my chef's hat on um no pun intended um we would uh we would keep you know trying to raise awareness in our industry that's the healthy industry and you got to remember that's quite a wide scope that's also what you're catering in the nhs hospitals which you have a lot of experience with ruby as well and then in the schools as well chefs and schools is another program that i work in hand with as well you've got you know there's just there's actually quite a lot of a lot of people you can influence there, I suppose, mm. uh, and to get that public message out there. So there's, um, I think there's a lot of, 
a lot of work we can still do around mm-hmm. all of that. Yeah, definitely. That's what I hope to see is. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, my, my uh, opinion is that if there's just so much potential with Curry Mess and, and, and the work that thus, thus far has been completed. And what it requires is like ruthless focus to achieve mm. those goals. And I think, you know, having a clear focus on um, the medical education side or the workshop side, the industry side, like, w- choosing just one of those as the team is so small and nimble, like that's Mm. probably going to be the secret source to success. And then once you've succeeded in that particular area, then moving wider and casting the net wider. Um, But I think, you know, because we're such an excited, excitable organization that's nimble and like, you know, passionate about this, it's quite easy to do multiple different things at once and just say yes to a lot of things. Whereas actually we need like, relentless focus and that's focus. something that you know yeah. has been my experience in my, in my own sort of professional life as well um yeah. but yeah like i just thinking back a, about like how much we we have achieved uh, is, is awesome and it's yeah. you know because of the passion within this organization so but it's been brilliant chatting about it and reminiscing on on uh, how it all yeah. started and i'm super excited about the next yeah. couple of years and we should definitely jump on the pod again uh to to sort of fill in yeah people with how they can potentially get involved as well and if there are any opportunities in that domain absolutely and we're 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 a small and mighty team and we are we have grown our team and we're looking to get grow our team further so we would love to come back and give an update on curry medicine and what what we what we've been getting up to because there's lots of exciting developments coming so yeah thank you so much for having us rupee thanks rupee